Hi, um, I'm Dr. Terrence Lee. I'm a solo private practice physician and a medical school professor in Southern California. I'm not an expert on the future of medicine and Bitcoin. Um, I don't, compared to all the really smart people here, I don't have much of a technical background nor a formal business training. But what I'm going to share with you in the next half hour are some real life stories of how I went on a personal journey from being somebody who knew nothing at all about Bitcoin to a physician who in his practice has actually successfully accepted Bitcoin from six patients and actually it's going up and counting, okay? Um, some of you may laugh and think that's trivial because we know we're not talking about millions of dollars here. Um, however, um, others of you may look at the other perspective and think that's fantastic because realizing that for the moment, this might put me as the most prolific Bitcoin accepting physician in the world. Um, now most of you, <laughs> most of you will be um, eager to hear my stories because it will help you know more about the thought processes of the Bitcoin adopters, both the business owners such as myself and the customers. And we're not talking theoretical, I'm talking real life experiences of the trial and error of what I've learned. Um, the nature of my work is a little bit unique and certainly has features that won't apply to other industries. However, there should be something here for everyone and that can help them succeed in accepting Bitcoin in their businesses. So this past year, we've all gotten really excited when we see um, one by one new mainstream businesses accepting Bitcoin. And we know that some of them are going to have a tougher time than others just by the nature of their business. And healthcare is certainly one of them. Um, and there's a reason for that. Because healthcare is already not a free market normal type of transaction. Okay? Uh, what that means is it wasn't always that way because just a few decades before most of us were born, when people wanted to go find a doctor, they, they had uh, approximately the same mentality as when they had to go find a plumber or go find an auto mechanic, meaning they had a problem and so they would go out and they would explore all the options and then they would go and um, you know, seek that person, and the two, the two parties would negotiate. Um, they would mutually um, come across some terms where the patient agreed, okay, it's worth paying this much, and the doctor agreed, okay, I'm willing to do it for this much. Um, and the, for, for the most part, that worked out great because, um, for one thing, doctors would compete. They would compete for patients by offering a certain level of care and a certain level of service at a certain price that the patients were happy with. And it was this competition that always drove constant improvement. But we no longer have that today because I'd say more than 95%, I'd say more than 75% of the healthcare interactions today involve a middleman. This is a third party, typically known as an insurance company, um, which ends up dictating a lot of what happens. Um, you know, who can treat whom, how the payments are structured, sometimes even what actual medical decisions are made. So whether this middleman is beneficial and helpful or is harmful and ineff inefficient, that's subject to debate, but no matter which side your beliefs are on in this matter, we can all agree that medicine, for the most part, is not a regular free market transaction, and as such, may not be that friendly to Bitcoin. Now, having said that, um, there are still some surviving areas of medicine that still work pretty much in a free market fashion. And I'm fortunate enough to be in one of these fields, and that certainly has been helpful in um, diminishing the challenges a little bit of accepting Bitcoin for me. So uh, the three areas of free market medicine left today are um, cosmetics and plastic surgery, and uh, vision correction, also known as LASIK. And then finally, the third is my area of specialty, namely infertility and advanced reproduction, re reproductive medicine. Okay, the official name of my specialty is called Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Um, in, unofficially, it's basically the field of helping people have babies. Okay, so this is what I do. Now, um, in my work, I encounter nice people who want babies, and in a small minority of cases, they want very specific babies. That's why they're seeking a doctor. Um, either they want a child that does not have a specific genetic disease that tends to run heavily in their family, or some people just want to have twin boys born in the year of the dragon. Um, so we can't always cater to those type of wishes. But the majority of people, they come because they're happy to have 
any healthy baby at all. And it, the reason is, for some, they have not been able to achieve this on their own. And so, because of that, um, they come to me, and that's essentially what I do. So just a little bit more background before I start talking Bitcoin. There are three main ways that I can help patients. Uh, one way is I can find something that's wrong with them and fix it so that they can just get pregnant naturally. Okay, that would be awesome. That's always the best choice. However, that's usually not what happens. Most of the time, I have to do something specific, either a low-tech procedure or a high-tech procedure to help them get pregnant. Low-tech procedure is called insemination. The high-tech procedure is called IVF or in vitro fertilization. Um, for purposes of this talk, I'm mentioning it because there's a cost difference in it, and that will come into play when we talk about the Bitcoin later. But as far as the medical details, I'm not going to go into it here. If you'd like to hear more about it, I have a 10-minute video on YouTube, and you can just search how to get pregnant, and it should come up on the first page. Okay? So, how did I get into Bitcoin? Okay, back in 2012, I stumbled across mention of Bitcoin on the internet, and um, it was nowhere near as popular and prevalent as now, but I was immediately impressed by the passion and the enthusiasm of the Bitcoin community. There was a call out to businessmen to please accept Bitcoin in your business and um, so that we can you know, help promote it. And so I thought to myself, why not? You know, I'd love to help. Um, at this time, it could be argued that I was a little bit naive because I myself had never encountered a Bitcoin. I never possessed a Bitcoin, and I really didn't know much of, of what Bitcoin was. So I set out on my journey, first, downloading the Bitcoin QT client. And I think many of you will sentimentally remember this as your first experience with Bitcoin also. Um, it took a while to load and, and synchronize, and after it was done synchronizing, it felt good. I had, I had accomplished something. It was really exciting. Um, I, I, was, I was staring at an empty wallet, but still, you know, this was some progress. Now I was hungry to get my hands on my first Bitcoin. And I figured the fastest way was just to earn some. And I went to a site called CoinWorker. And um, this is a website um, many of you might know where anybody can earn Bitcoin by performing various mini job assignments. Um, they were very tedious. And after spending about a half hour obediently completing all the assignments, I clicked to cash out and I received the payment for my labor, which amounted to 0.232 Bitcoin, which back then was the equivalent of less than, it was less than $2. So it suddenly dawned on me that this was the Bitcoin equivalent of working in a third world sweatshop. Um, <laughs> But yet, it felt, it felt good. It felt good. Um, if, you've, if you've ever played World of Warcraft, this was like creating your character, venturing out into the newbie hunting grounds, and killing spiders and rats repeatedly until, ding, you made it to level two. You know, in your heart, you know you didn't really do much, but yet it felt good psychologically. Now, more than ever, I wanted to continue playing this game. So I wanted to earn more Bitcoin, but certainly not on this site, right? Because I had invested the earlier years of my life, going to um, four years of college, four years of medical school, one year of internship, three years of residency, and two years of fellowship. So I wanted to see if I could use my medical skills to help me earn Bitcoin. So my next step was to put up the sign in my office, okay? So I felt the same excitement that I did during my childhood years in Indiana when I opened up my first lemonade stand. I was just ready for all these customers to come in. Um, but there was a difference, because with the lemonade stand, at least I had customers. With Bitcoin, according to my staff, nobody even bothered to ask what that symbol stood for. So on a slow day, I get about 10 patients in the office. And on a crazy day, I get about 40 patients, but nobody even asked what that was. So, at this point, I could have easily given up, but I didn't. I accepted that this was not working, and so I would try something else. Um, and that's what I did. Now, I spoke earlier about high-tech procedures and low-tech procedures that we offer. The high-tech procedure, the IVF, runs about $15,000. The low-tech procedure runs about $2,000. And I realized that my foray into the Bitcoin wilderness had to begin even lower. So I took the most basic test um, that we do, which is a semen analysis. This is a simple test looking at a man's sperm and getting a general idea of how fertile he might be. And I put an ad on the internet on a site called Reddit. 
um, which had a subsection devoted to the Bitcoin market. And here's the actual ad. In this ad, it says for one Bitcoin, but back then, the original ad was for 15 Bitcoin because 15 Bitcoin was about $75, and this is a $100 test. So um, you can read for yourself. Um, you know, this was more a, 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 a sort of like a message that, hey, I'm going to be out there and I want to I wanna support Bitcoin. And the comments that I got in the section were, you know, hey, we salute you. You're a pioneer. You know, go for it. But, nobody, but still nobody was interested until three months later. So I got a phone call and uh, there was an interested potential patient. So now this was really exciting. Um, you know, now as you can see, I'm up here enthusiastic and very open and transparent with you in sharing my story. But there is a regulatory entity known as HIPAA, which limits the details but of what I can share about my patients. So in today's talk, um, it will either be the case that the patient has given me explicit written permission to share up to the point that I'm going to share, or it's the case where I'm going to kind of disguise the demographics and be vague about some of the non-essential details so as to mask the protected health information, which the P call the PHI of that patient, okay? Well, anyway, back to, back to the story. So the patient, uh, he turned out not to be so much having a burning desire to know about his fertility, but he was a Bitcoin enthusiast, and he liked the idea of participating in history in this ritual ceremony of what could be perhaps the world's first me Bitcoin medical transaction. So we chatted about Bitcoin. He taught me a lot about mining. That's how he acquired his um, Bitcoin, and we did his sperm test, and it turned out he had really good sperm. So uh, that's, that's a... So there's a lot of lucky stories here along the way, and that was the first of them. After it was done, he sent me 15 Bitcoin, and so I had experienced yet another milestone, and it really felt good, okay? So now I was really hooked on this game, and I knew that in my heart, posting, Bitcoin, uh, posting ads on Bitcoin sites was not the best way of bringing in lots of patients, and here's why. I figured that in the pink, you have this huge group of people who are the people in the world who want fertility services, and then you have this ever-growing tiny fraction, which are the people who have Bitcoin. So if I was going to, as a businessman, if I was going to be targeting that overlap, uh -uh, that wasn't going to cut it, right? So I thought about it, and I got an idea. What if I were to help some of the patients in this big pink circle, the non-Bitcoin adopters, and I, would, I were to help them to become Bitcoin adopters? So it's kind of cheating a little bit, but, you know, it's going to do, hopefully it, it might succeed in what we seek to do. And so it began that over the next few months, through lots of trial and error, I started trying different things. Um, the majority of them failed, but I collected small successes along the way, and I built them, built upon them, and moved upwards. And as I share with you some specific case examples, I would like you to know what I've learned as the three fundamental principles of the success. Number one, be proactive about bringing up the idea of Bitcoin, right? So if I put an ad on the internet or if I put a sign out in the front of the office, that's not being proactive. But if I engage in conversation with the patient, um, then that is taking a step towards um, possibly increasing the odds that they will, number one, learn about Bitcoin, which is what was really my goal, and, and also um, that they may actually have a transaction. So I did this in many ways, and I gradually got bolder and bolder. Um, at first, it consisted of me just waiting for an appropriate time, you know, in our conversation to, to talk about it. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when patients talk about their fertility problems, they talk about their job and their stress, and so the conversation kind of then drifts away from the medical, and it, when we talk about, you know, we just end up almost like just sitting around having coffee, having a chat. Um, and uh, sometimes I will transition the conversation, hey, are you pretty active on the internet? And, um, you know, and engage their reaction. And um, then I say, have you ever heard of Bitcoin? Everybody said no, okay? But there were different types of no, okay? There was the no, which, which kind of like a blank stare, maybe I interpret to be a minorly hostile stare, and, and then I just kind of let it go, and we go back and, you know, talk about what, what we were talking about. But some of them, they were like, no, um, what's that, you know? And that could open up the way for a conversation about what Bitcoin was. Um, so that, uh, that was the first thing I learned. The second thing that I learned was to provide good incentives for patients to want to work with Bitcoin. Now, we all agree that Bitcoin is not yet in, in the state where, where we want it and where it would be to the customer's 
you know, universal advantage to use it. Um, like for, for my patients, instead of, you know, having them struggle to get their hands on some Bitcoin so that they can pay me in Bitcoin, they would rather pay me with a check or a credit card, right? Because that's, that's been what's, what's easy. Um, I mean, I would be happy if some of you out there disagreed with me because that probably means you're, you're working in a company that's fur furiously working hard to change that. And, and I, I can't wait until that, that gets better and better. Um, so, but for me, to make this worthwhile for the patient, I had, I, for, their, for their time, for their energy, and maybe even a bit for their risk, um, I would have to make it worth their while. And I'm talking about the incentive of discounted pricing, okay? So, you know, um, that's a big part of how I got these patients to successfully um, climb aboard the, the Bitcoin wagon. All right. The third thing that I learned is to provide and to educate and provide good incentives for your staff. Um, you will need to have everybody on your side if you're going to, you know, crack the Bitcoin barrier with your, with your customers. And it makes sense to make it worthwhile for them. Um, after our first successful Bitcoin transactions, I, s I have six uh, girls in my office. They're, they're excellent. Like, they're very enthusiastic, young, and uh, just, you know, really love their job. So, um, and, they, and they have a lot of trust in me. So I sent them the Bitcoin, and they, they all have their wallets. And one day they were just sitting around, and, I, and they were just sending it back and forth to each other. And they would say, oh, did you get it yet? Did you get it yet? Yeah, I got it. And they were just laughing and cracking up, and, and it was great. And one of them logs on every day and says, oh, did my Bitcoin are worth this? And, you know, and, they, and, and um, we were going to have an office lunch, you know, get a pizza, but we never got around to that. That would have been an expensive pizza. Um, but, um, <laughs> but it was great. So after the sperm test guy, I began with experimenting with bringing up Bitcoin to many new patients. And um, how this, this um, turned out to be kind of bad in some cases because these were new patients, right? So these are people who I'm just starting to establish this doctor-patient trust relationship. They didn't know me well yet and were naturally in a very cautious mode, and rightfully so. So in some cases, when I brought up Bitcoin, they stopped. And they looked at me like I was a telemarketer or a used car salesman and trying to sell them something. And in some cases, when I explained the best that I could what Bitcoin was, they even started reacting with suspicion or disapproval, as if I had suggested that I wanted to be paid in vials of crack cocaine or something like that. So it would have been really easy to get discouraged at this point and just give up. But I did something different. I changed my strategy. I narrowed the focus to patients with whom I had already earned their trust, okay? So my next Bitcoin success was with a couple who were my longtime patients. Very wonderful couple. My staff and I loved them. They, were, they had the greatest marriage. They, they, were, they were just the sweetest, and um, they just couldn't get pregnant. So we did a treatment five years ago and helped them have a baby girl who's just absolutely wonderful. When she comes back and visits the office, she'll sing for us and stuff. It's really fun. Um, and then after that case, they had some leftover frozen embryos. So they came back again, and they got twins this time. So now they've got this uh, lovely family of three, and um, they were back for one more time, ready to utilize the last remaining frozen embryos to try to have a fourth child. So this was good in many ways because, one, they trusted me very much and were 100% uh, receptive to anything I had to suggest, and we had been through so much together. So their reaction was, was something on the order of, uh, Dr. Lee, we don't understand this Bitcoin thing, but if you like us to use it, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be willing to try. So, so bless their hearts. They were willing to play along just out of gratitude and loyalty to me. And so I took it one step further. I offered to help them get their fourth child at a generous discount, something less than half my basic fee. So if they paid in Bitcoin, if they paid in Bitcoin right? So, no sh so short term, this was a loss for me, but for the value of giving me the learning experience of using Bitcoin, it was priceless. Also, I viewed it as a generous gesture to this couple who I was very fond of. So even from that, you know, from a karma point of view, it was a worthwhile situation. So now a win-win proposal was born. And um, so this time, I enlisted principle number three, um, which was engaging my staff, right? Because I'm busy being a doctor. I, I, my time, my 
is kind of stretched in all directions. So my um, office manager, who um, really, really um, you know, wants to do a good job, she wants to be, do what's good for the practice, she wants to make her boss happy, so she was on board with learning about Bitcoin. So we researched it, because we really didn't know what the options were out there. And back then, there were nowhere near as many options as there are today. So we researched together, and at this time, I had heard a radio ad or an advertising ad on a podcast called Free Talk Live. Um, and uh, heard about this company called Crypto Exchange. Um, it's sort of a, it's an, it was an exchange, sort of like an Australia version of you know like Mt. Gox. And I was persuaded to give them a try. So that's what we did. Um, we held the patient's hand, you know, virtually, and I li led them through the steps, even though it was something we had never done ourselves. So this was kind of like the blind leading the blind. But luckily, it worked. The, and the process, went something, um, the process went something like this. They created an account on a crypto exchange. Um, then they uh, generated a deposit slip. So uh, they requested you know, how much money they wanted. And then a deposit slip is printed. And then they have to take that to a local bank. And then they uh, took cash to the local bank. And all this, all this way, they were reporting back to us, totally you know, trusting and, and actually maybe having a little bit of fun at it. And it was done. And, and they had their Bitcoin, and then they transferred it to us, and we proceeded with the cycle. So this was our first successful transaction. And what we did, um, we um, took the remaining embryos. And so these are uh, day five embryos. They have the potential. They don't always grow. If we put in two, they don't always grow to become a baby. But there's, you know, depending on the age of the woman and, and the quality of the embryos and a lot of other factors like that, there's a certain chance. So we estimated maybe a... 50 to 60 percent chance per embryo of taking and one didn't take and the other did and so we got a happy story and they got their fourth child and this is actually to the best of my knowledge the world's first bitcoin baby okay <laughs> and uh, and it's not it's not the last there, there 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 are many that come afterwards so over time i got more efficient at spotting the opportunities to bring up bitcoin it wasn't always perfect you know i recall one time a patient was happy to do it but then she came back and said no because her husband said it sounded shady <laughs> so um anyway that, was, that case was the only case that we did through crypto exchange. And good thing, too, because I found out later that they went out of some business because of some controversy. So the next thing, um, we, um, by the way, we found out that here's an here's a, um, uh, uh, aggregate uh, article you know, on BuzzFeed about 14 things that you can buy with Bitcoin. And if you go all the way down to number eight, it talks about male fertility testing. They spelled our, they spelled our, our name wrong. We're Orange County. Um, but uh, that was pretty exciting. When my, when my office manager discovered that, she was just cracking up because she was searching for things that she could buy with her Bitcoin. So, yeah. So it's all, it's all pretty interesting. So looking back now, I realized that our Bitcoin experience closely paralleled what was happening in the world as Bitcoin matured because we had a lot of struggles trying to find ways to get into get cash converted into Bitcoin for our patients, but then it got easier and easier because more opportunities came up. The next thing that we did, um, we started doing some actual you know, trial testing. So we would open up our own account and, and practice and see, well not we, but my staff did, to see how easy it was to actually acquire um, uh, Bitcoin for in exchange for US dollars. And so um, the next one, the next success that we did was through a, a union of um, you know, the um, blockchain.info wallet and a company called BitInstant. Um, and so what they did was, um, I, I think you know the details of, of, of this, and, and, and um, that's, I'm not here more to talk about the technical side, but they generated a ticket, they took it to a, a local, um, I think they took it to a local drugstore, and they successfully obtained Bitcoin. And so that was our second success. Our third success used Coinbase. And I learned along the way that there's pros and cons of each of them. and um, you know, it was, it was great. They, for Coinbase, um, they actually were, didn't have to leave their house. They just linked it to their bank account. They placed an order. It took a while, okay, it took a while, but eventually they got Bitcoin, and so we got another cycle done. Um, now, by, by now, some of you are appreciating uh, a very important point. Like, these are all, like, you know, happy stories, but, but you probably, if you're really sharp, you caught something. Even though we had nailed down some success in accepting partial payment of Bitcoin from patients. We're doing this more as an experiment, 
right? We did it because it was fun for me, um, and I wanted to spread the news about Bitcoin. But if it came down to what was the most practical way of getting paid, it still would be back to the old ways. Why? Because um, there were delays, there were moments where, where patients called and complained, oh, when am I going to get, uh, my, my money's frozen, they're not going to send my money. This was, as you can guess, this was during some of the, you know, the ups and downs of the, of the times that these uh, various companies had. And, you know, I was very understanding. I said, you know, um, we'll just wait and see. And I kind of wrote to tech support on their behalf. And I also said that, um, you know, if, if you lose all your, like they had put their money in, but they were waiting for their Bitcoin and it didn't come. I said, you know what, if you don't get it, we'll eat it. And then we'll, you know, take care of you for that. So, um, it was okay. I mean, um, not a big deal. It was more fun things in life to worry about, right? So, um, and by the way, I'll also confess that most of these cases, ex except for the first one, they were not complete payment by Bitcoin. They were all patients that would pay partially by Bitcoin, and, and for what they paid in Bitcoin, I would match it. Uh, at first, it was pretty generous. I would double it. Um, so, like, if they paid 500 US in Bitcoin, I would give them 1,000 credit towards their cycle. Um, and now, and now it's gotten, now it's like, you know, I, I change this every day because I'm kind of, you know, playing it by ear. But right now, we take about 20 to 30 percent and add it on top of whatever they gave us. And the reason for this um, limit is the reason we couldn't do it in, in, in entirety, as you can guess, is because there were limits, right? For Bit Instant, um, it was a $500 limit. So unless they wanted to go to the 7-Eleven like nine times, um, the, you know, they, they, we would just do 500. And for me, the goal was not to accumulate Bitcoin, really. It was just to you know, get the patients to experience it, have a positive interaction, tell their friends and all that. But, but still, um, none of these, it, it was a, none of this was a situation where really Bitcoin was really that much ad, ad, advantageous to use. Now, having said that, you can make the counter argument that since most of our payment is by a credit card, we, we rack up a bill of about, a, um, on a slow month, maybe $1,000 a month, sometimes $3,000 a month on merchant fees. So, Yes, if people already have Bitcoin and they pay us in that instead of via credit card, that would be great. But for right now, it doesn't work like that, right? Because in order to get the Bitcoin, there's all, all of that opportunity cost, the commissions, you know, the explanation, all the work. Well, the next case, the final case that I'm going to talk about is different. And this is a situation where Bitcoin is actually clearly advantageous. And maybe even to the point of, well, worth, you know, the the extra work and all that. And this was an international patient. Um, we get a fair uh, share of patients from all over the world. And uh, one of the reasons, um, you might not guess, it's because Southern California has a great um, selection of excellent egg donors and surrogates. So we're doing, uh, uh, and, and there's also fewer regulations. And it might come to, as a surprise to you that the U.S. actually has less restrictions and, and, and uh, fewer regulations on certain things than, than other countries. So we get patients coming from the other country, and the phenomenon um, is, is really booming, and it kind of goes something like this. These are patients um, who are voluntarily and intentionally uh, making a mature decision to become single parents. Now, they do this by choice, not by random, you know, life events. They actually get themselves financially all set, and uh, it's no coincidence that most of them are older because, you know, it takes getting to your 40s, at least, to get financially stable. And um, then for some of them, after, you know, trying their hand at, you know, dating and not really being impressed by what's out there, or in some cases, some have uh, been through a previous divorce and, and tragically lost custody of, of, of their kids. Um, or for most of them, it was just a personal life decision that, hey, it would be great to be a parent and not give up some of the cool things about being single. Um, and, you know, this is a, a pretty, pretty interesting topic, and it's more than just about the biology of getting pregnant. It's about making choices, um, having good family support, you know, deciding if you're going to get nannies and all that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, I, I, I've you can, um, there are people who are out there who may judge this, but I, I conclude 100% that um, the people who have done this and they come back, they're very glad they did it, and the children seem very happy. So, uh, I, and I say marriage it can be a great thing, and I'm not saying it's not, but, but um, you know, now there are options. Okay, back to Bitcoin. Okay, so this is a man who was extremely successful. Okay, he wasn't a millionaire. He was orders of magnitude above a millionaire. He was very smart, um, had a lot of businesses, and he came with his uh, um, personal assistant. And so I talked to the personal assistant and him uh, simultaneously, and we focused on the logistics of how we were going to select a good egg donor, um, all that kind of fun stuff. But when it came back time to talk about the payment, I, I, I stopped and said, you know, 
I'm going to talk to him about Bitcoin. And he had a really great reaction. He knew nothing about it, but he was very enthusiastic. So this, I, my conclusion is this is a guy with a very smart business mind, and he immediately made a note of it, and uh, he sent uh, his, I, I think he said something to his personal assistant, you know, go, go research this, okay? Um, and uh, so... Um, we went ahead and got ready for the cycle, and when it came time to pay, we thought, wow, this would be great. We don't have to deal with the wiring, the international wiring, the, you know, waiting for all that. Um, but the story doesn't end quite like that. They decided just to pay with a credit card, okay? And this was a big, big uh, hit, you know, because that's a pretty big sum for this type of complicated cycle. But you know what? They paid with a credit card. So why am I even telling you this story if this is, uh, you know, this is nothing to do with Bitcoin? Well, it does. Here, here's what happened. So we went ahead and did it. We did a transfer. We found them a good surrogate. We put the um, embryos into the surrogate, and they have the, he has a beautiful baby boy. And then his uh, assistant came back. I was chatting with him, and he said, you know what? After we talked with you about Bitcoin, you know, Mr. So-and-so went back, and he's very interested. And in fact, he's, he's got a lot of, uh, he's looking at a lot of ventures into Bitcoin. So the moral of this story is that it's not a failure if you try to get a customer interested and passionate about Bitcoin and, they, and they're not interested because you may be planting the seeds. You may be planting the seeds of, um, you know, for the future. For, whoops. Can you, uh, can you pull that back up again? Hello? Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you may be um, uh, planting the seeds for the future. Um, So, so yeah, so this was a case that didn't quite make it, but, you know, it was, it, it didn't quite make it to be a Bitcoin milestone. Um, speaking of milestones, you know, we have maybe the first Bitcoin baby. On Friday, before I came here, I did an ultrasound on a patient who paid with Bitcoin. In fact, that was the one whose husband said it was shady, and we actually, you know, uh, persuaded him, and now she has twins. So what does this mean? We may actually also have the world's first Bitcoin twins. So, um, anyway... I'm an OBGYN, and I, I am, I'm very uh, proud to be an OBGYN. You know, I support the cause of liberty, and I support the cause of you know, people having free options, and I support Bitcoin, and I hope we can get out there and just make the world a happier place. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Dr. Lee, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. <laughs> uh, I'm Teresa Warmke from Free Aid, and from, we're an org what? Free Aid. Okay. We're an organization of medically skilled liberty lovers. Uh -huh. So we congratulate you on your uh, thank you. efforts to not give up on Bitcoin and yeah. really enthusiastically support it. Mm -hmm. Do you see any potential for Bitcoin to transform the way other medicine specialties are done and? Uh, or do you see any models under which other broader forms of medicine? Yeah, so um, that's a good, good question. You know, as, as I said, I'm, I, I don't consider myself as this expert about what's going to happen. I just know what happened in my own you know, small um, cluster of the world. But, you know, uh, plastic surgeons, that's a free market field that could be uh, able to do that. I, I was doing extensive searching on the Internet. There was a clinic that had one... It was, I, I guess I'm not in a place to really say what the exact story was, but I think they actually did a minor Bitcoin uh, transaction. Um, it has to do a lot with taking back healthcare completely, you know, where even if you're just paying with, you know, credit card check or cash, just bypassing this, you know, entity called, you know, this third party, either the insurance agency or the bureaucratic agency. Um, so to answer your question, I would love to see how it plays out and if there's anything that I can do to help, you know, just uh, contact me. Hi, uh, just curious, how, how are you tracking all of the transactions when, when so, patients pay you? And, you know, what, so this, is, this is very like uh, mom and pop, right? So this is not like millions and millions of transactions. Right. So we have a ledger, okay, that we keep for all our Bitcoin transactions. So once the Bitcoin transaction comes in, then we, we uh, account it as if they paid cash. Okay, and this Bitcoin transaction, my uh, staff keeps it very meticulously because she gets a cut of every, you know, again, this incentive <laughs> thing, right? She gets a cut. I used to give her one Bitcoin per transaction, but now that doesn't make, <laughs> make good sense anymore. She's happy to, to take less. So we have a Bitcoin ledger, and so this is 2012. I have an extension for my taxes, so I'm not done filing it. I needed to get more information together, especially I needed more advice on how to do the accounting on this, and that's kind of why I'm here at this meeting. If any of you can help me with it, I'm planning on just, you know, doing it as the, the cash price and just, you know, paying, paying for that. I mean, I don't, 
the, that's the question that more, there are more people here asking that question than who know that question. And even the so-called experts probably don't know that question because it has not really been answered yet by the IRS. Right, but when you have like a lot of patients that are paying Using but Bitcoin. see, how, how do you know, so my, how do you know which payment is theirs? You know, when oh, it comes, oh no, no, when because it it's all, to... it's all, uh, it's all like customer service, like on the phone. It's like, hey, you ready? Okay, send it to me, okay. and they send it. So okay. it's not coming it in time. after hours. And we always say, you know, send point oh oh one. We got it. Okay, send the other one. And we actually, you know, my May, my office manager, she says she can hear like the hesitation and the, um, you know, the the distrust change into excitement, you know, from the from the patients and. Um, some of them have actually, you know, started telling me that they started hearing about Bitcoin on the news. Um, a few of them know that I'm coming here to this talk, you know, so it's pretty uh, cool. Last, last question. Are you just holding all the Bitcoin that you're getting? Oh, uh, that's, you know, we'll, you we'll, we'll, there's, right, there's, you there's, um, right so here's, um, the answer is it's ever changing, right? Um, but I, I think that uh, I would love if I can actually use it to pay the suppliers or pay my embryologist or something like that. And, that. and that day will finally come. But for right now, this is not a big amount because it's not like the entire cycle. For me, it's more about the cause and all that. But if, if I were to, uh, you know, come across some, I would, I would probably hang on to it and not, you know, spend it unless I absolutely need to because that means I believe that there's a fair chance that it can, you know, go to a higher amount or that it can go to zero is what everybody says, right? So, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, I had a couple of quick questions. Sure. Uh, you were talking about Coinbase, how there were delays um, completing the transaction. How many days, how long was the delay if you... Okay, so remember? as I said, I delegated this to my office manager. So I'm just, I, I'm getting, you know, like reports from it. So I wasn't keeping like full track about it. But um, huh. this was during a time uh, a, well, the one particular case was during the time around, what, early April, and there was a lot going on at that crazy. time. It was crazy. So that's why it was understandable, sure. you know. Um, but it was a long time, and also there was the uncertainty, okay, let's say maybe seven days or so, there was the uncertainty of knowing, like, at one point, you want it to go through, and then another point, hmm, you don't want it to go through because now the price has dropped. And, and it's, it's very frustrating because it seems like well, I, I'm just saying from my perspective, it seems like it can be gamed because they can just say, oh, this one is too risky. It's not going through, right? And this one, okay, this one where you paid, you know, 230 for a Bitcoin and today the price is 70. Oh, this one went through. Congratulations. Sure. You know? <laughs> it, it, I, I, and again, in all fairness, I, I don't have, you know, I, I still right now am recommending Coinbase as, as the simple, for the simplicity. I think, you know, BitInstant is, the instant part is great. It's fast. It's really simple. Coinbase, you can get greater amounts. They all have their pros and cons. And, um, you know, they still are certainly beat having the patient, you know, go try to get through to an exchange, especially now it gets harder and harder. So there's a service that's provided. There's a value. So you pay a cost, you know. So it's all very fair. And I'm, I'm here, I'm always keeping track to see, you know, I'm here to see if there's any other options. And if there are better options, then that's the way we do things in life, always trying to improve and, and choose the better options, right? Is that, so, so your question was just how long the delay was. I think it was yeah. like maybe seven days. How does, how does that affect you? What, why, why, why do you care about that? Oh, because uh, <laughs> I've, uh, well, <laughs> I've used Dewala in the past, so I can't really use them, at least for the near future. And, mm. and, and I've looked in the You Coinbase. can't account BX, right? Oh no, oh, no, well, okay, never mind. And, I'm not uh, a technical expert, so I'm just talking. Yeah. 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 I got one pending now. Oh. Yeah. So you guys know I this more than, well, than, it's, than it's I do. It's good I asked. Um, so that's good to know. Okay. So uh, for case number four, uh, do you mind if I ask what country that gentleman was from, or is that just? Let me, th uh, let me think about. It. Let me think about it. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, China. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I don't think that reveals anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cut. So yeah, if you can guess who it is, uh, that would be pretty amazing. So since we're in the hoarding stage of Bitcoin, have you considered taking a uh, percentage we're, of your USD we're, sales? We're and what, I'm sorry, we're in the what season? Since we're in the hoarding, oh, hoarding um, season, season of, uh -huh. of Bitcoin, have you considered taking a percentage of your US dollar sales and converting that into Bitcoin proactively? Oh, you mean just, bu just buying it? It's, it's, something I would, it's, yeah. something, it's something to think about, but this is you know, more a question of like, personal investment strategy. You know? And I'm, I'm, I'm here to kind of talk to you about you know, my specific stories. But if you're asking me as an expert, like an investment advisor, which I'm not, you know. Um, 
Probably, you know oh, no, what? I'm just saying, is you that know, something you, know what? you consider? I would probably say maybe, but not so much because I'm, uh, there's a difference in my situation. I can, I can earn Bitcoin, see? So it'd be a little bit different if I couldn't, then maybe if I wanted to, that would be the only way to get some is to actually, you know, buy some. Yeah, I mean, what do you think? Um, if you think that the price is going to be more in five years, then I think you should probably right. I think take the, a percentage I think of your the price is, I think the price is going to be a lot more or it's going to be like, there's going to be something so bad that it's going to be... Right, like it's binary. Nothing. It's either going right. to be amazing or awful. Yeah. So, so, you know, life, life is about four things. It's, well, it's about happiness, right? And happiness is four things. It's doing something that has meaning. I've got that. It's having financial security. I've got that whether Bitcoin goes up or it goes down. It's about, you know, quality relationships with friends and family. I've got that. And it's about health and happiness. So anything else beyond that is just, you know, it's almost like not that important, right? So. Well, you seem like you got those covered. You're doing good. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I, I welcome anybody to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, um, pretty good about, you know, responding if anybody has any questions either about, uh, you know, life in general or about infertility. I, ha I have a, um, a blog, I have a podcast, and I'm, well, it's not much of a blog and podcast yet, but I'm working on a, a subscription site for people who have questions about infertility. So that's what makes this, and then I, I'm trying to figure out how to take only Bitcoin on that. So I'm here at the meeting to see if there's anything that can help me, okay? Thank you.